Hello and welcome once again to uh, the Nice Templar Church. My name is Reverend Steve Criscoll and today we are going to be continuing our journey through and we're nearly at the end of the Gospel of John. So today we're going to be looking at the beginning of uh, John chapter one, uh, 21, starting at verse 1. <clears throat> and um, we will, uh, first of all, then let us begin with a quick prayer and then we will get into this scripture. So let's pray. Holy Father, we pray, Lord, that you'll be with us and bless us through this time together that as we read your word. Lord, bless your word to us and help us to understand and apply these things that we learn into our lives. Lord, we ask these things in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so let's start. You need your King James Bible as usual, and you're going to need to turn to John chapter 1. Sorry, I've said it again. John chapter 21, verse 1. And it reads as follows. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter, and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Now Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Je then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it in, draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net uh, with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, <clears throat> they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to land full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh, and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples, after that he was risen from the dead. So says God's word. <clears throat> now, let me ask you, what do you do to rely on to make a living? Hmm? What's, your, what's your thing? What is it that you do for a living? Are you in construction, maybe, or maybe you're into farming, eh? Or you possibly work in an office, punching keys, or maybe you drive a truck. You know, the, the possibilities are endless. Um, have you had different jobs? No particular career, maybe. Just doing what you can to earn a living, maybe. Well, we all need to have some kind of income to pay the bills and survive, don't we? Um, but what if you've trained in a particular profession, you know, uh, thinking that that was going to be what you would do for the rest of your life? And then you couldn't, maybe you couldn't see yourself doing anything else. Maybe, as Peter found, fishing was the only thing, the only option he seemed to have. But then, have you thought about that? And then something just yanked you out from under, so you yanked the carpet from under you. And then all of a sudden, you're left without a job. The work that you thought you were going to do for the rest of your life. Well, it could have been redundancy, couldn't it? Or, or, or the company went bust, possibly. Maybe you were fired. It's possible. Or maybe you saw an opportunity that you just couldn't resist, and then you stepped into a new venture that met your wants and needs. Okay, work for yourself, perhaps. 
I mean, I've been there myself, actually, as it happens. I stepped out boldly, going where this man had never been. Yeah, sorry, that was a very loose Star Trek reference. Sorry about that. But I started off in a completely new direction, and I'm not talking about being a minister. Okay, that was that came later. I did the training for this particular job, and I passed the courses, and not too long afterwards I managed to get a job, actually in the British Health Service. And then, sort of around that age, I was around about 35. But, you know, when I joined that job, when I got that job, and I started, literally within the first week of doing the job, I realised that something was not right with this, with this job. What did I see? Now, I, I can't go into the story because we'll be here till Christmas. But uh, what I did I see? I saw subterfuge. I saw agendas being played out by all sorts of people. I saw lives risked. And money was the, was the language that people spoke of mostly. The language of greed. Oh, they said it was about um, patient efficiency and blah, blah, blah. But... Well, they said those things, but that really wasn't their mode or modus operandi or their method of operation. Now, I lasted in that job for a mere seven years <clears throat> uh, before I became, well, burned out. Um, and I was just trying to do the right thing. The right thing for my clients. The right thing for the what, what I deemed to be the health service. Now, of course, that didn't necessarily gel with what the health service thought but I had to make a decision it was either continuing this job and either a get fired or B have a heart attack because that's where I was heading or get out for my own safety sake and in all fairness for my client's safety as well because I was getting to the point where I was not necessarily effective for my clients. So what do I do? You know, then what? <laughs> um, how do I earn a living then? I've stepped out of this job for the reasons I've just given. I'm back to square one. I've got no. I've got. I've got diplomas and and I've got bits of paper, but I have no job. And the way I was feeling, well, it took me actually two years to to recover from that burnout. Recover as much as possible, anyway. I couldn't possibly go back into that line of work, so what do I do? And I'll be absolutely honest with you, I, I turned my back on God at that point. Well, in fact, it was before that point, actually. And so this is where I ended up. And I had a family, wife, two children. See, I think I made some poor choices, personally. Um, God didn't favor in any of those choices that I'd made. I didn't even consider him. I turned away from God. I'd left my faith somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you know, years before I was a committed Christian, fine. I was studying fervently, um, you know, but I allowed the deception of the enemy to creep in, to dissuade me of my faith mostly, not completely, and I just gradually turned away from God. I was to put it uh, mildly, an idiot. Some say I still am. <laughs> but I thought I knew better than God, you see. So I was more than an idiot, I was a conceited idiot. So there I sat, twiddling my thumbs, not necessarily in despair, but wondering where or not I could go from here. And here's what I did. I went back to what I started with when I started my work in life, more or less. I was ex-military, I'd spent 12 years in the military, so uh, it was back to basics. I could stand in a doorway with snow piling up on my helmet for, you know, forever until I froze to death. But that's what I'd done in the past. I can guard, I can stand there with my gun and, um, and look, well, look serene in the snow. Um, well, I didn't need a gun, but... Um, so I started working in security. I went back to guarding. You, there's not much to guarding, really, is there? Let's face it. Um, pay was poor. The hours were rubbish. 
uh, evenings, 12 hour shifts, night shifts and then I went on eventually changing jobs a couple of times to becoming a supervisor well I've, that's an even bigger idiot isn't it you're working more hours for what appears to be more money but it's actually not the hours went up then pay still poor and the responsibilities were large I felt like I was going backwards you know and I was actually but it was what I had to do to survive I continued like that for a couple of years until one year well I should say one day I found a way to bring me well God found a way to bring me back to him not I didn't find it it came to me you see my my inner miracle was my current wife it was because of her that I am here talking to you today so that's a bit of my story so you've got a bit of my testimony there um, and I mention it because I see the similarity between myself and what Peter's going through in fact all of those disciples that were there what they were going through see in our passages we see well seven or eight however many there were disciples sitting by the shores of Lake Galilee that's another name for Lake Sea of Tiberias by the way um, <clears throat> doing nothing much chewing the fat really just sitting around watching other guys go off in their sh in their ships to to sail out to the to do their fishing I mean it was probably late evening and several days after the Passover feast in Jerusalem so they've uh, trogged all their way back from uh, from Jerusalem having been uh, being there and witnessing Jesus's death resurrection and reappearance of um, and so it's taken them a couple of days, two or three days to travel back. They've been walking, don't forget. They don't have horses. Uh, and back to their villages in the north near, near Capernaum. And, and what they've done is they've just gathered by the shore, twiddling their thumbs, not knowing what to do with themselves, really. What are they to do? You know, They'd left their work as fishermen, and they'd loyally followed Jesus for years, perhaps thinking that they would never even return to the position they're in now they'd been through the crucifixion of Jesus uh, they'd seen his resurrection and witnessed him many a number of times but now they were left clueless clueless because they just didn't know how to do what Jesus had told them to do he left them a mission yeah of course he had he said spread the gospel but they're scratching their heads going, how? How can we do this? We're just fishermen. All right, they've had all the training, but Jesus, is their leader, is not physically there with them anymore. They just, to be honest with you, they didn't have a clue, really. So, they're sitting there, chewing the fat, like I said, and then Mr. Impetuous, that's Peter, jumps up and says, right, bad enough. Come, I'm going fishing, are you coming? he just returned to what he knew he realized that just sitting there chewing the fat it was getting them nowhere they may as well do something productive at least and go and see if they can earn some fish and they needed an income just like anybody else didn't they and Mr. Practical Peter or Impetuous Peter if you like was the first one to remember that they were actually all fishermen so time to get to work so they did so they all jumped up said okay we'll follow you we'll go so they jumped in their ship and spent the night well what happened well nothing basically they didn't get one single fish after all they had to think to themselves well, we need to supply our needs our own needs you know no Jesus wasn't there and let's face it um, yeah he supplied our needs when he was here but he's not here now this is the kind of thinking that they must have had so the practical jumping back in your, in your fishing boat and going doing your job seems to be the only way to do it so that's what they did so they've all gone back to fishing the thing that they knew the job that they knew and let's face it they all had memories of the years that had gone by you know the memories before they met Jesus the, net, the, the you know the hard nights of of hauling nets 
into the into the water and hauling them back usually empty yeah it's it's not fun is it well tonight was going to be no exception because all night they toiled and they caught nothing I mean I can only imagine the despondent feelings that they must have had they're, they're memories of Jesus they were just memories weren't they I mean they knew he lived but where was he what do they do now our leader is not here so when you add to those thoughts uh, that's going through their minds as they're sitting there in the dark in their ship throwing the net bringing the nets in they had nothing to show for it the sun comes up then it just comes up over the horizon over the hills and they know it's time to go home so they're not exactly going to be filled with the uh, with the springs of joy, are they? The joys of spring, the joys of spring, springs of joy, yeah. So they're coming up to the shore, and what do they see? Well, what do they hear first of all? Someone they see a man who shouts to them. He uses quite a familiar term. He shouts, "Children!" Well, it's a bit. To us, that might seem a bit odd, but I think to them it was more like a. A friendly sort of welcome. Now, John, John was one of them. Uh, John was quite specific in writing this greeting. He didn't say friends or brothers. He just said children. And at, at what point did did they recognise that it was Jesus? Is well, it's not clear. It's uh, John writes that Jesus shouted them to cast their nets on the right side, but what, he did that before John writes that they recognised it was Jesus. Now, would they do that? Would if they didn't know that it was Jesus? Would they, would they have thrown the nets in like, once more after a full night of catching nothing? Would they have done that if if it was just a stranger that they'd seen? I think not. I think that they recognised it was Jesus first. I mean, it was John who recognised him. He was he's the more spiritual of the group. And of course, the moment that Peter heard, right? What did he do? Jump straight in the water. Uh, Mr. Impetuous goes again. Off he goes like a rocket. Jump ship, and off he goes. And the rest of them are, have to bring in the fish that they've caught in this net. Right? Now, I didn't tell you the, the title of this, did I today? So I'll do it. I'll tell you the title now. It's called the Miracle of the Fish. That's fish in fish plural. All right. So, here's the miracle then. Here is Jesus. I mean, it seems like whenever he appears, there has to be some sort of purpose behind it. That's what we've seen so far, isn't it? And when he appeared in the in the room, you know, to the disciples on the day of the resurrection, well, his purposes were to show that he was risen, first of all, um, but also to give them, as we said last time, this... Um, the Holy Spirit and issue them with a command to go out and spread the word so again this temporary measure Holy Spirit uh, giving we can see the miracle of the fish I mean their net is filled with big fish apart from you know not going home empty-handed what was the point of this miracle and it's the only miracle that we have recorded that Jesus did after his resurrection. But do you remember earlier I told you about my experience, my life, my testimony? On finishing my career, I was left wondering, just like the disciples, what will I do now? How will I earn a living? I was just thinking in terms of job, money, income. I'd left God behind, like I said. No thoughts in my mind about how he could help me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the disciples are kind of in the same boat, if you'll forgive the pun. And Jesus, what does he do? He demonstrates that if, you're put, if you put your love and trust in him, he will supply your needs. <clears throat> How about that? How wonderful is that? Hmm? I know I didn't. I didn't trust in God at the time. And I struggled like mad with a number of things. See, these men in this boat these men now knew that God had not forgotten them. God had a plan for them. 
It's just that he hadn't fully revealed it yet. It was going to be roughly another month or so until the Feast of Pentecost. And if you remember that one, that's when the Holy Spirit really did come down on all of the apostles in power. But that was a while off yet. So even though Jesus was now resurrected in a spiritual body, he still performs this one last miracle. So now they can all tuck into a fish breakfast, can't they? Hmm? And they see that Jesus has already prepared breakfast, but they've got a few more fish now, so yeah, all they need to do is hand a couple of those over and they can have a real feast. Marvellous. They caught so many. And as was their usual action, action, by the way, they counted all of them, 153. I mean, the only significance to that is that just shows that they'd fallen in their minds, they'd fallen back into, I'm a fisherman mode. This is what they did. They would always count their catch. It's worth money, after all. And you want to know how much it costs, how much you're going to get for it, don't you? So that's the miracle of the fish. And the purpose behind it, simply, what? To show that you trust in the Lord and he will provide. Now, look, I'm not suggesting for one moment that, you know, you go out one night and you go to, I don't know, Las Vegas and put money in the slots or go on the thing. And then by the end of the morning, uh, Jesus is going to turn up and, um, and give you a whole a big bag of cash. All you need to do is just put your money on 21 black and you're sorted. He's not going to do that. But we need to trust the Lord for our provision. What happened to the disciples that day was a lesson for us all, not just for those guys. We need to trust in him. We must. So, in the next, and um, that will be the final sermon in this series uh, from the Gospel of John, we're going to compl conclude John's testimony about the life of Jesus. Now, just remember, please, the Lord, that's what I just said, the Lord God is there to supply our needs. They might not be your wants, but your needs. It might not be in the timing that you, that you want. It might not even be the need that's most important to you that you get an answered prayer for. But just remember that God's plans are not our plans. We cannot force God to do anything, and it's futile and possibly dangerous to try. May it be God's will. Dios Volt. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. God bless you.